So what I thought I'd do with you today is uh, kind of talk about, uh, as the title of this talk suggests, some tools you could use, maybe five tools that you can use to sort of make uh, Chumash and Tanakh come alive for your kids. Uh, whether your kids are six, or whether your kids are 20, 30, or 40, or older, I think that these are some tools that you can use judiciously. Um, any one of these tools alone, if you walk away with just one, will enhance uh, your, your appreciation, your kids' appreciation of what it is you learn every week in the Parsha, every time you open up a Sefer Shmuel or a Sefer Yona or any other, or any other copy of, of, of anything in Tanakh. But when you use the tools together, when they synergize, um, that's when really beautiful things can happen. Um, and it's like learning how to use them together is like anything. It's practice. It's like shoemaking. There's 15 things you need to know to make really good shoes. And if you know one of those things, it's great. But if you can put the 15 things together in practice, you can become a master shoemaker. So um, I, I, it's been an exciting journey for me to use some of these tools, and I hope um, that you will find it equally exciting. Let me kind of jump in. And I thought what I would do is just share with you some, uh, some material that I've been researching lately. Um, this is new. You won't find it anywhere. I've never written about it, and I've never put it online in any kind of way. It's something that I just happen to be working on now. So I want to share with you my current uh, thoughts, which are in flux, and give you a taste of some ideas about the Megillah. Purim is our next major holiday on the way. So we're going to talk a little bit about the Megillah and try to use that to illustrate some of these tools. Um, the first tool really is one that I talked about in my very first book in the introduction to the book, The Beast That Crouches at the Door. And I call that tool breaking the lullaby effect. What I mean by that is I talked there about what I call the lullaby effect, which is the tendency that we have to lull ourselves to sleep with texts that we know too well. We often think of our knowledge of Chumash as an asset, and it clearly is, because the more you know, the better off you are in many respects. But there at least is one respect in which the more you know, the more hampered you are. And that is that it becomes very difficult to step out of what you know and to see the text in a fresh way and to actually become aware of the questions that are embedded in the text that the author wants you to struggle with. The classic lullaby that we use to get our kids to sleep is rock a -bye baby on the treetop. When the wind blows, the cradle will rock. When the bow breaks, the cradle will fall. And down will come baby, baby and all. And if you think about the violence that gushes from our mouths when we sing this to our children and we actually get them to sleep, it's a wonder that they indeed do fall asleep. But the reason why they do is because they're not thinking about the words. They just let the tune lull them to sleep, and hence it's called a lullaby. If, of course, a child actually thought about the words of that lullaby, he would have many questions, or she would have many questions. You might have questions if you started thinking about it. Who put the baby up in the tree? How far off the ground was the cradle? Did the mother put the baby there? Did anyone call 911 afterwards? Did anyone arrest the mother? Why are you telling this to me? Are you trying to kill me too? I mean, there's lots of questions that an aware reader would ask, but we just don't ask those questions because um, we can know the text too well. So the Megillah is one of those texts. We, you know, year in and year out, you know the Megillah. So it's hard to sort of pull back and see the obvious questions. But the questions are windows. And step one is to be able to actually ask the questions that the author of Tanakh, is, or the author of Chumash or Navi, is counting on you to ask as step one in a journey. And if you will not even acknowledge the question, you have no hope of taking that journey. So the best thing you can do with the lullaby effect is engage in a little meditative exercise. Um, you just have to sort of consciously, before you begin to read something, erase everything that you know about it. Um, 
in yeshiva, I always had a bad memory. I couldn't really remember anything from one day to the other. That actually is an asset in a way, right? Because it allows you to see things fresh in the morning that you might have seen one way yesterday. So try to um, rejoice in your memory problems and try to erase uh, whatever preconceived notions you have and embrace the text and almost pretend you're a non-from person, you're seeing this text for the very first time, what would strike you as strange? And let's just try this in the Megillah. In the Megillah, I'm going to share with you actually a question that I have, and frankly, I never asked this question for many, many years. I was a victim of the lullaby effect. And one of the reasons why we don't ask these questions is that we don't even allow ourselves to see them because unconsciously we realize that if we were to see the question, the question sometimes is so big that if we can't get a satisfactory answer to the question, it will destroy your appreciation of the whole book. And that is very threatening and very scary. So sometimes we hold back and just will not even allow ourselves to acknowledge a question. And this is one of these questions that for many, many years I never really acknowledged. I'm going to share it with you right now. Mordechai, he's a good guy, right? Saves the Jews. He's the best. But what if I came and I made a devil's advocate argument to you about Mordechai? And I questioned whether he was a good guy on the following grounds. What if I said to you, okay, so one second. This whole genocide thing, that right, it's all because Mordechai won't bow down to Haman. Why won't he bow? Why doesn't that guy bow? Let me just throw that out to you. We'll do this discussion group style. You tell me, why isn't Mordechai bowing? Hmm? Ah, so he say he's wearing an idol. So of course, right? Okay, so could we please open up to the page in the Megillah, right, where it says that Haman is wearing that idol. And you can flip through the entire Megillah, and you will not find the page. Now, that story about the idol does come from somewhere. There is a medrash that talks about the idol. It says that there is, a, right, it's an obscure medrash out there tucked away in the middle of, of Esterraba that talks about this idol that was hanging around Haman's neck. But now the question I have for you is, okay, so why wasn't that in the text? Right? I mean, like, how much of a bother would it have been to put that, like, a few words, maybe four words, to just talk about the idol in the text? We have all the text that talks about the horses running here and running there over and over again, right? How fast does the horse, take out one of the discussions of how fast the horses ran, you know, and put in that there's an idol around his neck because it's not like it's irrelevant information, right? Because the whole story rides upon this. In other words, if Mordechai doesn't have a good reason for what he's doing, let's just understand that he's not a hero anymore, right? He's just, he's just, he's just, right? I mean, he, millions of people are going to die. He's, he's, and even, by the way, if he doesn't know that, because he doesn't know that Haman is going to go crazy over here and decree genocide against everyone. But he's got to figure that at least he's putting his own life in danger. But why is he even doing that unless he has a really good reason? So tell me about the idol. Why can't you spare four words to tell me about the idol? Which leads to the next tool that I want to give you. Next tool I want to suggest to you is a tool about medrash which is, what is the purpose of medrash? When you encounter a medrash like this, how do you deal with a medrash that seems to say something strange that just isn't there in the text, right? The medrash that you learned in school about when Bat Paro, right, came for Moshe. So what happened? Batishlach et amata vatikacheha. She sent her maidservant, but the rabbis say it wasn't a maidservant. What happened? She sent her arm. Right? So her arm extends like 30 yards, like a fishing hook, grabs the child and comes back. Now, how do you deal with a medrash like that? My kid once came home with a long white arm from nursery school. It was the daughter of Paro's arm. What do you tell your kid in a situation like that? So the question is, and, and the principle here is, medrash is sacred, but it's not the same as pshat. 
right? You have to understand that medrash is different than pshat. It is, in other words, if you think that medrash is pshat, the simple meaning of the text, then what you're really thinking is, God didn't really know how to write his book, so he wasn't such a good editor. So he left out a lot of really important things that the rabbis put in at various points because God couldn't figure out a way to say it himself in the book. So that's what it means to say medrash is pshat. Medrash isn't pshat. If that was pshat, if you were the daughter of Paro, which, by the way, leads me to my third tool, right? Third tool is going to be, what is it like to be there? Actually imagine yourself in this situation. Put yourself in Bat Paro's shoes, right? Here you are moseying along the Nile one day, and all of a sudden you see this little baby, and before you know it, your arm extends 30 feet, grabs the baby, and comes back. What happens next in the story? What would you do? You'd run screaming back to the palace, and you'd say, my arm, my arm, what happened to my arm? It's not like this happens every day, right? It's, it's a very strange kind of thing. So what are the rabbis saying? The, the metaphor that I'd like to suggest is that the rabbis are, are that, that medrash is drash and not pshat, which means there are different layers of meaning in the text. It's another layer of meaning, much like listening to music. When you're listening to music, there is melody and there is harmony. These are two layers of meaning in the music. Hopefully, they come together. But what happens if you're only playing the right hand on the piano, if you're only playing the melody? It sounds like melody. Well, what, that's pshat. What if you're only playing the left hand on the piano, the drash hand? What if you only listen to Old MacDonald Had a Farm with the left hand? What does it sound like? It sounds like craziness. It sounds like it's just it's weird, right? But if you listen to the two together, if you say, no, the rabbis are picking up on something in Pshat, they're highlighting this, they're harmonizing to it, they're bringing out a point, they're embellishing, they're enriching it, right? They're not coming to contradict what happens in the text, they're not coming to fill in missing information, they're coming to tell you something about the meaning of what you already know, then... Already, you're looking at medrash as medrash. So when the rabbis talk about this idol, they're not necessarily filling in facts that you should have known. The facts are all there in the Megillah. They're telling you something about the meaning of those facts. So we'll have to come back and understand what that meaning is. But back to our basic question, just why is it that Mordechai doesn't bow? And you might say, by the way, forget about the idol. He doesn't bow because simply bowing before another human being, even if they aren't wearing an idol, that's a vodazara. That's idolatry. You can't do that. There are, in fact, some mafarshim that seem to take that approach. However, it's a difficult approach. How many times can you count in Chumash, where people bow before other people, and it's not considered a vodazara? And he's not, right? Avram. Avram bows to Bnei Chait when he's trying to purchase an, a kever for Sarah. The brothers bow to Yosef. Yaakov bows to Yosef. Yaakov bows to Esav. Batsheva bows to David. Everybody bows. People bow. It's the way that you show deference. So it seems strange. Why won't, uh, why won't Mordechai bow? I'm going to try to work a little bit more with some of these tools with you. But just to remember, so far, three tools. A, break the lullaby, lullaby effect. Stand back and just ask yourself the threatening question, which would destroy the Megillah if you don't have an answer. Why doesn't Mordechai bow? Two, what's it like to actually be there? Put yourself in the situation. Ask yourself, if I am... In this situation, what is it like to be Haman? What is it like to be Mordechai? What is it like to be the courtiers? <clears throat> Number three, how do we understand medrash? Medrash is harmony rather than melody. What does that mean? So today I want to, look, to take a look at a couple medrashim with you that seem to shed a kind of harmony sort of sound on this issue of why Mordechai doesn't bow. Now, I also want to try to develop three stories with you if we have enough time. The Megillah is the story of the Jews facing persecution and possible genocide, but it is also the story of particular people. What were their stories like? What I want to focus on with you is what was Haman's story like? What was it, did this character develop at all? What is it, who is Haman? 
Is he Darth Vader? Is he just the guy who walks in at black in the beginning of the movie and you just know he's the bad guy and that's it? Or does he develop over the course of the Megillah? Mordechai, is Mordechai the good guy or does he develop over the course of the Megillah? And finally, some little known folks who I think have a story of their own, the courtiers, the people in the court of the king. Nobody ever talks about them. As a matter of fact, in our popular imagination, when we think about the moment when Mordechai doesn't bow to Haman, normally in your mind's eye, the way you think about that moment is Mordechai decided not to bow to Haman, and Haman noticed Mordechai, and Haman became very angry, so he decided to kill all the Jews. But if you actually look carefully at the Megillah, you'll find that's not what happened. There were actually these intermediaries. There were these courtiers. What was the courtier's story? Why is that story even there? Why does the Megillah bother telling me about these useless courtiers that I know nothing about? What are they doing in the story? So let's tell their story too. What I want to do with you now is to actually go into the Megillah and to try now to look at some of the text closely. And again, we're going to try to combat the lullaby effect. This is text that we've read a zillion times. And we're just going to try to read it very simply without knowing anything and just let it talk to us and see what we can find. Let's look at number two in your handouts. If you don't have a handout, you can just listen to me reading it. And let's see what we find. So, after these things, which means after the assassination attempt that Mordechai foiled, so Gidal HaMelech HaChashverosh, and by the way, that itself is strange, because if you had to play, and this is another good tool, by the way, it's not on my list, but you can add this as number six, and we're, I'm going to just call this tool, What Happens Next? It's a great game to play, where you stop a Pusuk in the middle, and you pretend that there is no end to the Pasuk, and you have to figure out what logically should happen next. So here we are, Acharad Varma'ela, after these things, so we know what happened relates to what happened right before, because it starts with after these things. What are these things? After Mordechai successfully foils the assassination attempt, finds out about Big Ten and Teresh, tells Esther the king is saved. And we know that Esther told it to shame Mordechai, so the king knows that Mordechai is the one who saved him. Acharad Varma'ela, after these things, Gidal HaMelech HaChashverosh, the king HaChashverosh, elevated at blank. Come on, guys, who would you guess it is? You totally think it was Mordechai. No, it's Haman. It's this demagogue in training, right? That's who it is. Haman's the one who gets elevated. Strange. Must make, was that a slap in the face to Mordechai? We don't even know. But if you're Mordechai, you got to be maybe a little disappointed. Anyway, Haman gets elevated. Vayinaseyu, and he's lifted up. Vayosem es kiso me'al kol asarim asherito. And now Haman is the, is the big second in charge, the new head honcho in Persia. He is more powerful than any other advisor. V'chol avde ha-melech, asher b'shar ha-melech, and all of the advisors of the king, all of the advisors, asher b'shar ha-melech, korim mishtachavim l'hamem, they're all bowing down to Haman, k'chein tzi v'lo ha-melech, because so the king commanded, Mordechai lo yichra v'lo yishtachaveh. But Mordechai, he would not bow. Now, Vayomru avde ha-melech asher b'shar ha-melech l'mordechai. Now, remember, we don't know why he's not bowing yet. So we, the reader is sitting here on pins and needles like, why isn't he bowing? Now, guess who asks that question? It's not like the Megillah is impervious to that question. Someone else wanted to know. It's our friends, the courtiers. The courtiers actually ask our question. Listen to them. V'chol avdei ha-melech asher b'shar ha-melech, all the servants of the kings. By the way, something which we don't always realize, which is that the command to bow seems to have not been a command to the general population. It was a command seemingly to all of the servants of the king and the king's court, right? Because kol avdei ha-melech, all the servants of the king are the ones bowing. Mordechai, by the way, is one of the servants of the king. He is also Yoshev Bashar ha-melech. Exactly what his job is, we don't know. Maybe he's a mid-level bureaucrat in the interior ministry. Maybe he's the special advisor in charge of queenly affairs. We don't really know exactly what Mordechai is doing in the court, but he is one of the servants of the king, and he's not bowing. Anyway, at this point... They all say, Why are you 
transgressing the commands of the king. Let's stop right now. And if the Megillah stopped right here, what would you want the next Pasuk to be? The answer. This is the moment where I lean forward as a reader and say, I wonder what Mordechai is going to tell. Like, if he's making some sort of principled stand, this is the time to come out with it. This is your 15 minutes of fame. Come tell us what it is you're thinking. But that's not what the Megillah does. It turns out that Mordechai does not answer. He just remains silent, which is like crazy. Why doesn't he say something? But he doesn't say anything. Another thing, which, by the way, which we should take a look here, and this is one of my five little principles, which is that principle number four, or tool number four to think about, is that similar Hebrew words do not usually have identical meanings. So, for example, how do you say why in Hebrew? There's two words, madua and lama. One of the interesting questions is, what's the difference between those two words? Are they the same word, just used interchangeably? Probably not. They're two different words. What's the particular meaning of lama, and how is it different than madua? And might that help us understand what the courtiers are asking? Because they're not asking lama, they're asking madua. Now, how would you know the answer to that question, what a word means, right? The answer is you don't look it up in Ben-Gurion's, you don't, what's in the Ben Yehuda's dictionary, you actually look elsewhere in Tanakh and you see how the word is used. So if you think about when else in Tanakh is the word madua used? When else is lama used? Right? Can you come up with any examples of lama and madua in Tanakh? There you go. How about what Moshe says? The, by the way, the craziest thing in the world, what Moshe says. Moshe at the Egel. You are Moshe, called upon to defend the Jews at the moment when they are about to be destroyed. Here's what Moshe comes up with. First thing he says to God, God, lama yechera abcha bamecha. Hello? Am I the only one who thinks that? They're dancing around a calf. What do you mean, why are you upset? That's going to win the day, and it does. He succeeds what kind of question was lama yecherab chabamecha? But it was lama yecherab chabamecha. It wasn't madua yecherab chabamecha. By the way, it's not like Moshe doesn't know how to say madua. Earlier, madua lo yivar hasne, at the burning bush. Moshe himself says madua. What's the difference? Lim ma seems to be a forward looking question, which really means for what, to what end? When you're talking, that's one kind of why. What are you trying to achieve? Madua, from the word mada, or really mida, from knowledge, is to try to investigate what happened to cause something to be this way, to find a meaning in the past as opposed to the future. When you're looking at a bush and you want to know why it doesn't burn, what's the nature of this bush that it's such that it doesn't burn? What's going on with the bush? You're looking for something in the past, something about the bush. What, Moshe, what God was saying to, when Moshe was saying to God had nothing to do with the past. In the past, we all know why God is angry. The people are dancing around a calf. Moshe's point is, Lama yechereb chabamecha, lama yomru mitzrayim, where is your anger going to get you? If you're angry, what, you can get rid of the people, look at what Mitzrayim's going to say. Look at what the, the Avos are going to say. The future is problematic. The courtiers are not asking lama, they're asking madua. How does that change exactly what they're asking here? But let's continue reading. We'll come back to that. So here Mordechai does not answer. For some reason he's silent. Pasuk Dalad. He asked them over and over again, the courtiers did, and they just, he never listened to them. Finally, Vayagidu Lehaman, they told Haman about this, these courtiers. Lir'os Hayam du Divre Mordechai. Now, this is strange. Why is that strange? To see if Mordechai's words would stand. What's problematic with that phrase? What words? He didn't say anything. How, he has no words. What's going on? The man was silent. How do they know what, he's, what Mordechai is saying? No, they know. Sounds like the courtiers know, even though Mordechai is silent. Very strange. Now we have very strange words. Words that perhaps you could use to suggest to me that you know why Mordechai doesn't bow. Maybe it does have to do with Havadah The words are, 
Ki higid lahem asher Yehudi, because he had told them that he was a Jew. So you pounce on those words and you say, ah, I understand now. It's a matter of principle. As a Jew, he can't bow. But there's a problem with that. Look carefully at that verse and tell me, do you really think ki higid lahem asher Yehudi in that verse is explaining why Mordechai can't bow? If you were the author of the Megillah and you wanted to explain to me why Mordechai couldn't bow, and the answer was, because he was a Jew, where would you put that? Let's just read it one more time. Back to Pasuk Gimel, all of the servants of the king, they come and they say, why won't you listen? Wouldn't this be a great time? To have Mordechai's answer, Mordechai should just say, Vayaged lehem Mordechai ki hu Yehudi. And Mordechai said, it's because I'm a Jew. Answer, we're done. Well, they don't have to keep on badgering him. They already know. They know. And why are they badgering him if they already know, if he had told them he was a Jew? Answer is, the Megillah doesn't say that that's why he's not bowing. Ki gilai ma'asher Yehudi is not the reason why he's not bowing. What's the reason for in the verse? Look carefully. What does ki gilai ma'asher Yehudi really explain? Finally, when, Haman, when Mordechai was silent, they eventually told Haman about it to see whose words would stand. It's the reasons why the courtiers rat on him. It has nothing to do with why he's not bowing. It has to do with why they tell Haman. They tell Haman because he's a Jew. Right here, you get a hint into the nature of anti-Semitism in the Megillah. It's the very first moment of anti-Semitism in the Megillah. Haman is going to take this and run with it. But to really understand anti-Semitism in the Megillah, you can't go to Haman. You have to start with the courtiers. What does ki higid lahem asher yudi really mean? Allow me to suggest a theory here. Those of you who have been around the block with me before know that 40 minutes talks do not do well with me. So I apologize if I'm only able to give you a little sliver of something here. But... Um, Let's read this one more time and see where this might be going. There's one last little observation which we didn't make yet in these verses. It's a pronoun problem. I want to show you the pronoun problem. Let's read it one more time. After these things, the king elevated Haman and lifted him up. It made him the most powerful of all the advisors of the king. Now, everyone is bowing to Haman. Why are they bowing? Look carefully at the next words. Because so the king had commanded him. What's the problem with that phrase? It shouldn't have been singular. It should have been plural. It should have said, Kichain siva lahem hamelach. Now you could say it's lavdafka, some mefarshim do. But if the text is being precise, it is very strange. Who's him? Who's the low? There's an ambiguous low there. Kichain siva lo hamelach, for so the king commanded him. Who did the king command that all should bow to Haman? What's the only possibility left? It would have had to have been Haman, which means you read the verse this way. The reason why the courtiers all started bowing to Haman was because, quote, so the king had commanded Haman. But what's wrong with that? A few things. A, why are they commanding Haman if the courtiers are supposed to be the one who bows? You commanded the wrong person. What are you even doing? The second problem is, what's the courtier's only source for the information about this decree? There is no Pashkevilus on the walls of the palace saying everyone has to bow to Haman. There is a private conversation between the king and Haman. Haman comes out of it one night, right, and says to the courtiers, hey guys, you're all supposed to bow to me. Now, if you're a courtier, what's the problem here? I mean, he's my only source of information. How do I know I am getting this information exactly correct? And anyway, isn't it strange that the king would command Haman that all should bow to him? 
maybe they would authorize Haman that all should bow to him, but to command Haman seems kind of strange. Seems like Haman's representing this as a decree, but and, and it leaves it to our imagination. It's ambiguous what really happened. There is an ambiguity surrounding this decree. It seems like there was some sort of private conversation which the king had to Haman, but there's two things to think about. Number one, you know that old story about the Hasidic Rebbe who dies and the two sons are fighting over who's going to be the next Rebbe, and one son says, it's it, it's settled, father came to me in a dream last night and said, I'm supposed to be the next Rebbe. To which his rival responded, if dad wanted you to be the next Rebbe, he shouldn't have come to you in your dream, he should have come to me in my dream, right? That's the courtiers to Haman. If you're one of, now, now take our tool, which is put yourself in their shoes. Put yourself in the shoes of the courtier. Haman comes out of the palace one night and says, you'll never guess what happened last night. I was schmoozing with the king. Totally, you guys are all commanded to bow to me. Really, you totally are, right? So what happens? You roll your eyes, but are you going to bow? Probably. Why are you going to bow? He's a pretty powerful guy, Haman. I'm not going to go up against him. So in your heart of hearts, you roll your eyes like, okay, this is Haman again. Right? I get it. This is the same guy later, by the way. Is all, right? See, talks to the king. The king, the man, the king wants to honor. Put on the king's clothes, the king's crown, the king's horse. There, he's very transparent about wanting the crown. Here, it's less transparent. It's the beginning of his journey. As a matter of fact, even Haman himself may not realize how megalomaniacal he is. Haman could be a sweet guy. I mean, he just got elevated, but he's got the ring of power now. And with the ring of power, all of a sudden, you find yourself having a conversation with the king one night that kind of goes like this. Sire, I really appreciate the promotion. Um, we'll, together we shall do good things for the Persian Empire. We shall bring order to the realm. Um, but uh, there's one little thing that seems to have been overlooked just a bit in all the hullabaloo surrounding my promotion. Um, sire, don't you think it would benefit the crown if whenever I go out and about in the palace, everyone would sort of, you know, just bow to me? I mean, sire, we all know this isn't for me. I am but your humble servant, sitting at the dust of the king's feet. But with all the power that you've given to me where I go, there goes the might of Persia. Is it not in your interest, O king, for them to show deference to me? Because by showing deference to me, they're showing deference to you. They're showing deference to the might of Persia. What do you say, king? Now, interestingly, what happened? The king didn't take that and make a decree. The king must have said yes privately. So what happens if you're the king and you say yes privately, but you don't make a decree? Think about that. You ever hear that phrase, not everything you think should you say, not everything you say should you write down, and not everything you should write down should you blast in an email that the Russians can intercept? <laughs> <clears throat> you know, there's different levels of putting something out there. And you can think something, it's legitimate to think it, doesn't mean you say it. You can say it, doesn't mean it's legitimate to write it. To, to write it doesn't mean it's legitimate to publish it. And if you're a king, what you say in private conversation is not the same thing as what you decreed everyone. So in private conversation, it's like, if I'm the king, it's like, gee, that was awkward, right? But uh, okay, Haman, yeah, maybe that would be a splendid idea. I think that would really be something, having everyone bow to you. Well, Haman, you know, we'll talk about this some more tomorrow. Haman, though, tanks that out to the bank, comes to these guys, and it's like, you'll never believe what happened last night. The courtier's story. If you're one of the courtiers, what's your story? You roll your eyes the minute you hear that decree. You know what's going on. It's Haman on a power trip. But when it comes time to whether you bow or not, you may well bow. Now, put yourself in the shoes of one of the courtiers. How do you look at yourself in the mirror in the morning? 
You're a loyal servant of the king. What are you doing? This is a power grab. This is a man trying to reach for the crown. Everyone should be bound to the king. By the way, let's come back to our chazal that we were wondering about. Remember that chazal? The idol around his neck? You read the Rambam about idolatry. How does idolatry start according to the Rambam? It all started with people with the best of intentions. They looked at the sun, a great and powerful servant of the master of the universe, and they said, why should we just give deference to the master of the universe who is so abstract and you can't touch and you can't feel? If we could bow to one of his great servants, the very powerful son, we could give deference to the master that way. Oh, we've heard an argument like that before. Haman is just the political equivalent of adultery. Enter the sages and they talk about the idol around his neck. They're saying he is idolatry. That's what it is. It's just an attempt at idolatry. Because sometimes there's these one things that separates the king from everyone else. Which brings us to another chazal. We'll come back to the courtiers in one more second. Another strange chazal. Five minutes. We'll try. The, another strange chazal. Chazal say, remez, two minutes. <laughs> remez lahaman minatora minayin. We all know the answer. Chazal tell us, hamin ha'etz. Very strange. Those are the words that God says to Adam after he's taken from the tree of knowledge. Why would that be remez lahaman minatora minayin? Well, hamin ha'etz. There were all these trees in the garden. You could have all of these delicious trees. There was just one tree, the master's own tree, that you couldn't eat from. And here comes Adam. Do we have any evidence that he ate from any of the delicious trees? No. He went straight for the forbidden tree, the one tree that belonged to the master. Because the master wanted to show, it's my garden. I'm giving you all these gifts. Just stay away from my one tree. And that way you understand it's my garden. But no. Why did Adam want that one tree? Because he wanted to pretend that he was the master of the garden. So God comes to him and says, Hamin Did he eat from that one tree that I told you not to eat from? And that, the sages say, is Haman. Strange. Is there, here Adam was, he had reign of all the trees, but there was only one that he wanted. And those meant nothing to him. Just the one he couldn't have was the only thing that mattered. Anybody in the Megillah remind you of that? He had everything, but the only one thing he couldn't have meant everything that. Who is that? That is Haman talking to Zeresh. Haman says, I have all of this, the poor guy. He talks to his wife and kids about how rich he is. He talks to his wife and kids about how many kids he has. He tells them, I have all of this, but I only have one thing. Mordechai not bowing to me. Every time I see him, nothing else matters. So Zeresh, the Chava figure, says to him, why don't you just have the one thing that you can't have? And listen to her language, Ya'asu Eitz. Why don't you make a gallows? But the Hebrew word for gallows is tree. And Ubaboker say to the king, V'yitzlu et Mordechai alav, and hang Mordechai on it. And what's Mordechai going to be? The one fruit dangling from the tree, hanging from the tree. It really is the forbidden fruit. The master is the master because there's one thing you can't have, but Haman consistently wants that one thing. So back to the courtiers. So if you're a courtier, what do you do? You're betraying the king by bowing, but I'm not going up against Haman. And you say to yourself, look, he says there's a decree, there probably was a decree, he's a powerful guy, I'm bowing. And it's all good. Except what happens? Out of the corner of your eye, you see out there in the corner, there's this Shmerel over there, Mordechai. He's not bowing. He's the one servant who's not bowing. What does it do to me when I see the one servant of the king that doesn't bow? He indicts me. He makes a mockery of all of my rationalizations. And hence, along come these guys and they say, Madua ata over at mitzvah ha-melech. How come you are going against the decree of the king? But notice that it's not lama. If it were lama, 
They would be asking, what principle are you reaching for? What are you trying to show? What do you hope to achieve? But they're not even saying that. They're saying, what pushed you, you slime? What, what's, what do we not know in your past that's getting you to be like this? There is no answer to that question. They have foreclosed any possible answer to the question. The question is rhetorical. It's an indictment, and hence there can be no answer, and Mordechai is silent. And in that silence, he speaks volumes. The courtiers know exactly why he's not bowing. He indicts them. He is the one true loyal servant of the king. And so, Vayhika Amrame Lav Yom Vayom Velo Shamayalam, and now the fifth tool, intertextuality. Where have we heard these words before? Chazal pick up it on Nestor Abba. Where is the other time in Tanakh? You have Vayhi Ka may love Yom Vayom, someone battering someone else day after day, and they will not listen. It's Yosef in the story of Ashes Potiphar, adultery. She is trying to seduce him. And what does he tell her? He says, I can't do it because you're the one thing that separates me from the master. The master's given me everything in the household. Lo chasach mi meni mu'uma. He hasn't withhold anything from me. Ki imotach basher ishto. Except for you, you are the forbidden fruit that I can't have. It's the same story. And just as Yosef was heroic and understood that he could not take the forbidden fruit because if so, he pretends that he is master, Mordechai understands that he has to become the forbidden fruit, that if everyone else is sold out, there has to be someone who stands up for the king and will not bow. And therefore, they ask him over and over again. And finally, Vayagidul Haman Lirot, they tell Haman to see, will Divrei Mordechai stand? Because they know what Divrei Mordechai is. His silence is Divrei Mordechai. And why do they do it? Ki higid lahem, asher Yehudi. Because he's a Jew. I've figured it out. I know why you won't bow, because you're the immigrant over here. Yeah, we know you. We tried to build a wall, it didn't work. You somehow crawled under, you miserable cur. You are a Jew, and that explains everything. Of course you're not loyal. It's the only way they can rationalize their own disloyalty, is to cast aspersions upon him as the other. And that's why they tell Haman. And that's the beginning of anti-Semitism in the Megillah. And then Haman picks up on it. Haman picks up on it because there's nothing else he can do. He's infuriated. But when he goes to the king, what's he going to say? Uh, sire, you remember that private conversation we had, you know, about, like, just between you and me, that whole, you know, bowing thing? Well, like, there's this guy, he's not, like, bowing to me. What's the king going to say? It's like, yeah, okay, fine, so, right? That's not going to work with the king. So you're in rage. Your only chance is to distract the king the same way that the courtiers have convinced themselves that they're loyal because the Jew is the other. So for sure he's got something up his sleeve. That's what Haman does. Haman says, Yesh no amachad mefuzarm for Abbe There's some Jew. And guess who they all learned it from? When Ashet Potiphar comes, the betrayer, to protest her own loyalty, fakely, to her husband, and to damn the one who is in fact loyal, what does she say? Ru'u, hevi lanu ish ivri l'tzachak banu. There is the immigrant card right there. All of a sudden, he's the ish ivri, right? He's just the ish ivri. This is the beginning of anti-Semitism in the Megillah. We didn't get to Mordechai's story, but I'm out of time. This is the beginning of a, of, of a piece, but I, I want to leave you with the following thought. The tools are powerful. You can apply the tools. They lead, I think, to remarkable kinds of inspiration. If you think about Mordechai, Mordechai was engaged in a particular act of loyalty, which was very much similar to Yosef's. Yosef was so loyal to his master, he knew that when he left behind that coat, what might happen? 
When you leave a coat in the hands of a spurned woman, it's not the greatest idea in the world. He knows it means another trip back to the boar. Every, every fiber of his being screams, I'm not going to go into the pit. I'm not going to let someone strip me in my coat one more time and go back in the pit. But he does because he understands that that's the only way he could be loyal to his master. And he knows, and this is the most painful part, that his master will never know that his master will always think that he has betrayed him. And the great dark night of the soul question for Mordechai is, what would you do if the only way you could be loyal to someone you had to be loyal to was by seeming to betray them? And they would never know. They would think you betrayed them, but that's the only way you could hold on to your integrity and the only way you could be loyal to them. Would you even be loyal then? Chazal say, Bnei Rachel, Nisan Shava. Their trials are the same. Ugdulasan Shava. The two Bnei Rachel and Esther Rabbah are Mordechai and Yosef. They pick up on that intertextual parallel between Eshet Potiphar, and they say it was exactly the same test. Would you look like a betrayer in order to be loyal? And that is Mordechai. Mordechai, to everyone, looks as just some guy who defied the order of the king. The king will never really know this time. He just looks like a betrayer, but it's the only way to really be loyal. Someone has to stand up for the king if no one else will. It's the beginning of anti-Semitism, being condemned for that kind of loyalty, but it's also perhaps Mordechai's finest moment.